Uh, the reason I'm passionate about explainability is because as, as a creator of these kinds of AI systems, um, you know, there is a responsibility that, uh, that we have in, in sort of figuring out when they might go wrong. A lot of our lives today are governed by these narrow AI systems that already work quite well in the narrow domain in which they are, uh, in which they are built. Uh, but how do we govern them? And I think that's an important problem for our age that we need to try and solve. So I believe there are these five interesting questions that we have to begin to answer, which is, is the input data biased? So if the input to a machine learning system is biased, or if it's incorrect, or if it has a blind spot in a certain area, how do we detect it and how do we fix it? Uh, the second is, is the model making systematic errors? So is it the case that you know, whenever it's raining outside, the model is just showing me weird news on Google News? Uh, again, that doesn't happen, but you know, that's the kind of thing you would like to know. Uh, how certain are we about the model in the regime of the input data? So I have a model, for example, a mortgage model at a bank, and it's making decisions, but a new type of lender has started applying for my model, maybe because there's an economic shift or a social shift. Uh, is the old model is not valid anymore. How, how do I know that it's actually making good calls or not? Can you explain the logic behind the model? So generally the answer is no. So, but then what can you do? What's the next best thing you can do? And how do we detect regimes where we're missing data and then how do we gather it? So let me give you a few examples of these, uh, these problems. The first one is the input data biased. This is a generally pretty depressing study. Uh, the data is available uh, on CDC. And so what this, what this data is, you know, for every hospital visit, when somebody goes into triage in the ER, you know, there is a model that's run to figure out how acute is this. Should we look at it right away, or can they wait? Uh, and so that's called the triage model. And what you see is uh, on top, the same network or the same data, it's colored by the predicted mortality of the model. And at the bottom, it's colored by the actual mortality that you see. So you will see a couple of things in this. The first thing that you can see is that generally speaking, the model does a fine enough job. Right? Generally speaking, you see more bad mortality towards the right. Generally, the model is, is making those predictions. It's fine. The second thing that you will notice is that the model is very optimistic. Right? The model is very regular and very optimistic. There are lots of places here that are certainly at the bottom yellowish that the model is, yeah, it's, it's blue, it's happy, it's fine. Um, the one particular area that I want to point out is, uh, is, is circled up here, which is the model says it's totally fine, no problem, and those people all end up basically not surviving the ER experience. So the question is why. It turned out that these people were delirious enough that they couldn't answer a few questions on the survey. So missing data was causing this problem in the model, right? So this is an example of how do we detect bias in the input data to the models where we can then go hopefully correct it, either in some human way or process, or in some systematic way. Second example is the model making systematic errors. Uh, this is an example from, um, from a fighter jet. Uh, if you've read the news uh, recently, the F-30 and F-16 programs aren't doing amazingly well. And one of the major reasons is that a lot of pilots in these systems are having hypoxia events. And what that means is when they're flying the plane, all of a sudden they, are, they become unconscious. And when they, you know, when they eventually land, it turns out that they had a severe lack of oxygen for a small amount of time that led them to becoming unconscious. Um, now, obviously, this is not lost on anybody, not on Lockheed, not on Boeing, not on the Air Force itself. So the question is, you know, what are they doing about it? And to their credit, they've installed lots and lots and lots of sensors in the plane. So in fact, a plane today collects about a terabyte of data every minute from all these sensors, right? Now, again, the obvious problem when you collect a lot of data is how do you know when, you know, how do you know that, uh, when do you know that data is actually pointing to something useful or not? And similar to the compliance thing that I talked about earlier, in this case, 99% of those cases are just false alerts. They are alerts that happen where you alert on every single variable. So for example, the thrust of the plane is too, I'm making this up, but the thrust of the plane is too high, so you're alerting on it. But it's not really meaningful. The things that lead to these weird events are combinations of events that you have to find. 
So in this example, you know, you discover the systematic errors that the false alarm model is making, and then you expose it to uh, through a user experience that's usable by a domain expert, so that a domain expert, you know, who wants to get to the root cause, is able to figure out the root cause and fix the problem at root cause. Uh, and so this is an example in figuring out systematic errors. The third is how certain are we about the model in the input regime of the data? So we've created a model. Uh, and so this case, this is a financial stress test model. And we want to figure out which variables are the most important. I'm just speeding up a little bit just looking at the time here. Uh, so I'll go quickly through this. But again, the case here is that for every time you get an input to the model, you can place it on the model that you created in the back end, this topological map. And you can figure out, is it, a, is, it an, is it a region of high certainty or not? So at least you can attach estimates to every prediction that you make individually and say that, hey, if I'm recommending this news article to somebody, you know, what is my estimate that I will be correct in this prediction? So I think it's a really important ability for models to have to do that. Uh, Finally, uh, the second last example here is how do we explain the logic behind the model? So this is a picture of Alvin. Uh, for people in the machine learning community, this was the first time we built kind of a self-driving machine. Uh, and it worked pretty well, actually. right? It, it, it worked uh, amazingly well for the time. It had a camera system and a self-drive system and all of that. Um, it turned out that you know they built this over the fall. They built it really, really quickly. And when they tested it on the first day of summer, it didn't work. So the question was, why? Why is it not working? <laughs> and it turned out that the model had learned to, to, uh, to basically see the sky as being gray. So if the sky was blue, the model was like, what, what just happened? You know, I, <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> so today, in our image detection systems, we run way more complicated models. So this is a, this is a deep learning model. Uh, for people who have who've seen the news recently, deep learning is making all sorts of waves in perception problems, things like image classification, you know, text and sound and so on. And in all these perception problems, you know, when you learn these models, they're essentially huge arrays of numbers. That's what a model is these days, like these deep learning models. And they require a large amount of data to train, and there is no easy explanation. You know, so if somebody said, why did this model do this, what am I going to say? Will I say that the computer knows how to multiply numbers correctly, so hence it must be correct? Because that's the best I can say today, is the model learned these numbers, and the computer knows how to multiply, so you know, that's it. Um, we think there's a better way. So this is an example where you use topological data analysis to introspect into the model. What you do is you take those large weight matrices that you've learned, you throw it into the topological data analysis framework, and it helps you figure out what are the base patterns that the model has learned and how are they connected to each other. Uh, in fact, it also allows you to speed up the training. So there's a problem in machine learning called sample efficiency. How much data do you need to train a model so that, it you, so that you like its result? Uh, sample efficiency is a huge problem. And so topological data analysis, at least in this perception visual problem, allows you to speed up your training time by about 4x by giving it some topological information about the, about the base underlying data.